A big hello and a very warm welcome to Brand Equity with me, Sonali Krishna. It's 2020 and I have a very special guest with me, uh, joining me right here at the Brand Equity studio. He's a unicorn and he and his brother did the impossible. Launched uh, a brokerage firm, a retail brokerage firm in 2010 when everything was amiss globally. Markets were down, trading was down. Uh, nobody in their right mind would be wanting to do anything with the stock markets. But these two brothers had the gumption and uh, you know, created this uh, retail brokerage firm called Zerodha. I'm joined by the founder of Zerodha, who is none other than Nitin Kamath. Thank you so much, Nitin. Truly a pleasure having you on ET Now. Thanks, thanks a lot for having me here. So, you know, uh, before I uh, dive deep into uh, the details as to what you're doing right now, uh, for the sake of my audience, uh, you know, Zerodha, which was launched in 2010 and we're now into 2020. In 10 years, you've become a formidable player. In fact, you've become, uh, you know, the most powerful player in your space. Right. Uh, 10 years uh, for any company or brand to become the most formidable player right. is uh, a very tall task. Right. Uh, but before I get to how that happened, uh, take me back to uh, how you had the gumption to start something like Zerodha in 2010 when, uh, you know, the world was falling apart. Right. And given the fact that, you know, I believe you, you had parents who had, uh, you know, a pretty traditional jobs. Your mother is a music teacher, your uh, father was a bank manager, uh, and you being a, a South Indian boy, uh, how did you have the gumption to uh, start something like this, which was so risky? Yeah, I mean, uh, so I, I used to trade the markets before that okay. uh, in an individual capacity for a while. So I started trading when I was 16, 17 kinds and um, kind of blew out my account twice. And I worked in a call center for two, three years uh, to kind of uh, you know, put up the trading capital back. So in 2003, four, I met one person who, who saw my account performance for the last three years. And he said, why don't you manage this money for me? And I quit my job and the journey of uh, being trading for yourself to trading other people's money also began. That, that started in 2004. I became a franchisee of uh, Reliance Securities uh, in 2006. Uh, and 2008, when the markets fell, we were kind of short in the markets and made some money then. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and then, you know, in 2009 happened, you know, I, I think uh, we missed out on one of the biggest bull runs of all time. You know, there's two days when market went up 40%. And in that frustration, I said, I want to stop, take a break from trading. And uh, my younger brother had joined me by then, and he was a better trader than I was. So we said, why don't you continue trading and let me try building this broking, you know. Why broking? Because uh, I had traded with 12 brokers by then. Okay. And, and then, you know, the, you know, I kind of saw the, you know, kind of a sweet spot where, uh, you know, you could be an online only broker. Uh, because traditionally for brokerage firms in India, actually financial ser services firms in India, uh, physical presence was a moat, right? Okay. Like, you know, because they are present in so many places, you know, they can onboard customers and etc. Right? But in 2007 and nine, you kind of start, start seeing people going digital, completely online in the way they trade and etc. So we thought, is there an opportunity to be an online only broker mm. uh, who's, who's gonna you know, have a very digital online, you know, low cost kind of presence and then can we help traders like us to reduce the trading costs, right? And when the business started, it was being built for few, very active day traders. You know, I mean, it, it never was planned to be what Zeroda is today. That no, was not was, your vision. It wasn't, you know, it was meant for, you know, like if you like uh, music, right. you know, uh, live music, you know, you go set up a, you know, a bar with a live band, right? I mean, it was, it was meant to be something like that, you know, so like, you know, so let's help people with similar interests right. to kind of save on costs. But then as the business started growing bigger and, you know, uh, and the more I kind of started learning on the industry and etc., the opportunity seemed much bigger. So yeah, let me stop you there for yeah. a moment. You know, and you said that you started trading at the age of 16. Right. I mean, that's pretty tough given the, you know, given your environment, right. you know, where, you know, typically, uh, you know, like, like for instance, a family you hear from, right. uh, the stock markets are a big no-no, right? Right, right? Uh You know, it's always like safe investments. And to think that your 16-year-old son right. has started to trade, right. uh, how was that acceptable? I mean, for a long time, they didn't know about it. Okay. <laughs> you know, so so it was... you had so much pocket money? <laughs> no, no, I mean, it was, it, so the thing is, uh, in you know, as a for day trading, right, you get leverage, right? You could have 500 rupees and you could 
buy 50,000 rupees worth of stocks, right? right? So it was, you get leverage when you're trading. And I, uh, I used to stay in this very Marwadi community okay. back in Bangalore. Ah. So I had, you know, people around me who were very actively trading. So that's how I got introduced. Right. So in 2010, I mean, you also decided to get into this, not only start a retail brokerage right. firm, but also get into the whole discount uh, pricing model, right. which is basically a flat fee of 20 bucks. Doesn't matter the size or the scale of the trade, correct? Right, right. When I was researching you, I saw some quotes where people had said that you don't even get uh, a samosa for 20 rupees. Right, so this right. is like absolutely <laughs> ridiculous. Right, right. Uh, given that there was, you know, so much experienced people and masters were uh, so pessimistic and actually ridiculing right. your move. Right. Uh, as a 30-year-old, uh, you know, young right. adult, right. how did you manage to convince yourself that you're on the right path and, you know, uh, keep on? I think... If it works out, they call it, you know, passion, being smart, etc. If it doesn't, you call you call it foolish. I mean, I think luck is a very integral part of this, right? I right? agree, but you right. know, whenever one makes a decision, foolish yeah. or not, right. at that <laughs> point, you believe you're making the right decision, absolutely, absolutely, right? right? So you must have also at no, that no, point... I, I truly, <laughs> no, I truly believe there was an opportunity to be a broker for people like me who are trading very actively, right? Mm. And I think one of the enablers for this was uh, back in 2008, National Stock Exchange of India, they launched this... Uh, like a platform called NSC Now, uh, which was like a free trading platform that they gave to all their members. Right? right. So as a broker, right, what's your largest cost, right? Which is your trading platform, the right. tech cost to run your platform. If you're a digital broker, right? Okay. I mean, if you're an offline broker, yeah, you need offices, you need people, and et cetera, right? So, uh, so, uh, so NSC started this platform called NSC Now, which they gave it free of cost to their members, right? And that was the enabler, actually, you know, because Tech came free of cost. Mm. I already had like three, four people who were working with me and we had a small little office. So we were like, you know, the only real cost was the exchange deposits. Uh, you know, to be a member in India, you have to pay a crore and a half as deposit. And that we had made in 2008 and all of that, you know. So so we put that money on uh, as a deposit and there was some 30, 40 lakh rupees left on the table and we started the business with that. But you felt for 20 bucks you'd make a profit? I mean, do you think, it, do, do you envisage it as a profitable business? I mean, I never thought of the scale, right? I mean, I, as I said, you know, I mean, not in my wildest dream, I would have thought that. So today we execute between three to five million trades a day, mm -hmm. right? So not in my wildest dream when we started, you know, I would have thought even reaching one tenth of what we are at today. You know? So, uh, so, so yeah, you're so saying I think, it wasn't like this raw ambition that you wanted to be no, the I mean, largest was, no, 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 retail no, no. brokerage I mean, I would firm be, I would in the be, country. No, absolutely, no. absolutely not. But uh, tell me, when you started off, given that you were this young boy starting off, uh, and some, and you know, digital only, which was yeah. not that familiar. People weren't that familiar at that point in time. What kind of challenges did you face in getting onboarding customers? Right. And how did you go about customer acquisition in such a cluttered and competitive market? No, I mean, uh, see, the thing is, I think in the business of money, right, mm -hmm. credibility is the most important. Absolutely. Right? Right? I mean, yeah. would you park your money with a bank because they give you uh, say 12% on a fixed deposit, right? As soon as you know the deal is too good to be true, you you kind of question if the yeah, it's you look at the person with suspicion. Absolutely. Right. I know. So that was the biggest challenge mm -hmm. for us. I mean, for most of our life as a business, the question was you charge so less, so what's the catch, mm. right? You know. Uh, and uh, so when we were smaller, when we were starting off, it, that was even bigger challenge. Uh, so in my call center days, I used to telecall. So I used to call uh, US and sell whatever you know sure. I can and. So we essentially the first two three years we cold called. You know? Really? Yeah. yeah. Like so, you had a just like, yeah, a, I mean, like yeah. telemarketing. Yeah, I mean like four five of us sat and I mean I must have opened the first thousand. I mean I've gone picked up I don't know how many account opening forms, and I used to go with a different name because uh, you know you didn't want the CEO of the company to come <laughs> over and open uh, open account opening for you, right? So I I used to have a pseudo name for myself and I used to do the telecalling and. Uh, uh, so yeah, so I mean, it wasn't easy the first few years. The, the biggest problem then was that is that, dude, what is, you know, what is a, like what is the credibility? My money, my securities. Yeah. Is this even a safe guy? Right. And uh, and I think also what helped was uh, you know like I had spent 10, 12 years before that building these online communities. Mm. Oh, uh, yeah. You know, so uh, so suddenly you know we kind of started plugging Zeroda into you know a bunch of these places. But I think you know as and when people. Uh, started believing that dude, it's all safe, it's all okay. And, you know, we started getting more press and all of that. So then, you know, it, you know, there was a hockey curve growth after that, you know. So you're saying basically your initial impetus to get the word around 
where be it cold calling or this online communities which you were very much a part of and an mm. active member of and pushing it subtly there right. were the only two real levers right. to get zero da the traction it did absolutely wow yeah i mean even even today right till date we have spent zero rupees on advertising right and uh, so we stopped cold calling you know <laughs> because uh, you know regulations don't allow you to cold call anymore <laughs> but you know and uh, but uh, i think i i still spend at least a couple of hours every day answering people's queries you know so even today right you know if i as a ceo or do you have no, a as a ceo okay, i mean today i mean CEO. today you know it helps <laughs> building a brand right as in uh, no but from the time zero that started online i've always been me right, right. so we we launched our first blog uh, in 2011 we call it z connect uh, where we started just writing about everything you know i started writing about everything about the business right and people have never seen transparency in financial services firms right because right. Usually, you know your credit card companies, your banks—they all make money by being opaque as a business, mm. right? Because you know you you can't figure what people are charging you for, sure. right? And uh, we took a absolute opposite stance, saying that I'm going to be transparent about everything that I do. So in 2017, uh, you know there was this new concept called direct mutual funds that became popular on the exchange, right? Where the person selling doesn't make any commissions. I can charge customers separately for a transaction, but I don't make anything from the manufacturer. Sure. So we are today the largest direct mutual fund platform in the country. You know, so we uh, we I think uh, we have done almost ten thousand crores of investments on that platform, and we make not a single penny out of selling mutual funds from the manufacturers. Right. So that. So that, how do you make the money? So we don't today. <laughs> so I mean, so there it's are. It's a free service. It it is, you know. But then uh, it's just that you know it's it's a brand building exercise. You know, I mean, we are saying. Uh, we are starting a loan against securities business, so we are like, you know, maybe if tomorrow someone who's bought mutual fund wants loan against it, he'll probably borrow money from us, and we'll probably make a buck out of it, you know. So that's very funny because if you are basically not charging much, you right. know, uh, then how is it that you know your uh, numbers in terms of your profitability are right. uh, so impressive? Right. So the last we I, I saw you closed. The year I think in 2019 at 350 crores, right. uh, which is solid for a company that's just 10 years old. Right. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, so share with me the math. Okay, so 99 percent of the turnover on the stock exchanges uh, are speculative in nature. Okay. Right? So this isn't you know buy stock, hold it for next day and sell. Right. That buy stock, hold it for next day and sell is is one percent of the business. Right. Okay. So we generate between three to five million trades a day. Out of which, at least a million to two million trades generate some kind of revenue for us, okay. right? And uh, so it's just it's just economies of scale, you know. It's just uh, you know uh, at twenty bucks you 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 do a two million math, you know, you get the number, right? So it's uh, um, so that's how we make money. And uh, today we are uh, we are quite a big player. So we are we are largest by trading turnover by a big margin. So how think, did that happen? Right. Like how did you become the largest with like zero advertising? Right. I mean. you know i'm sure you know the marketing uh, professionals and advertising <laughs> professionals right. and even ceos are watching this right. be a bit dumbfounded because people spend crores of rupees right. on advertising and you know still suffer so right. uh, or do it rather well uh, but my point is how how do you justify the kind of awareness amongst the public right. Right. with such a niche uh, you know means of communication how did how did the word spread Okay, so so there is there is a very interesting uh, you know, piece of the journey, right? So in 2013, Kailash who heads our tech today, okay. right? He joined us, right? Okay. Uh, I was uh, I was bankrolling a startup back then, and he was part of the team, and that startup didn't fly, and then he joined us, and around him we built a tech team, right? So so this whole journey from using a vendor-based product. to our in-house product started from 2013 okay so 2015 is when we put out our first platform you know which are ah. right our in-house trading platform which was so kite. this isn't uh, yeah kite, kite you know what we call kite and uh, we took an absolute different approach to you know a building investing platforms it was clutter free it was a very new age and all of that you know so so it's uh, this whole active trading community right there is kind of an intangible network here Right? Because, uh, like I said, right, I got introduced to trading from this friend of mine. Mm. Like, if you have done any trades, it's most likely that someone introduced to it, sure. right? Uh, so, so there's this whole influencer community that's you know that's constantly talking, right? Right. And and they won't talk just because they saw an ad, right? They talk if the product is good, okay. Right. So, uh, like, 
it's it's not even funny how much time, effort, love, blood, sweat, you know, we put behind our product. You know, so it's uh, so we are constantly thinking twenty four seven what's the best product that we can offer our mm -hmm. customer. You know, coming to uh, funding for your company, right. I believe that you did approach a lot of VCs, but nobody was willing to uh, right. invest in you. Is right. that accurate? Yeah, I mean, the thing is, uh, I think we were very raw in all sense. You know, I mean, there was no pedigree, education background, or uh, so. I don't think if I was a VC and I, uh, you know, I was approached by a startup like me, I wouldn't have invested. In, you know, sure. right? So I don't think. They, and then, as I said, you know. Usually, people invest, you know, in in her, right? As in, uh, I don't think in 2010 anyone would have wanted to invest in a stockbroking firm. You know? Yeah, that's so, true. Yeah. Right. So, uh, and I think it kind of worked out well for us again, right? So now you're zero funded from the outside. Yeah. So we haven't. There is zero debt. There is no uh, no VC professional investor. I think uh, not raising money in the start was kind of uh, was there was no option. But saying no to money over the last few years, uh, you know, when people are ready to cut really big checks has been, uh, you know, has been quite challenging. But I think the reason, you know, the reason is that I think one of the edge we have on our competitors today is how nimble we are, right? Like I said, right, as in the reason we are better than our competition is because of our product. Our product is, is better because we are so nimble in how we adapt to, you know, new things that are happening around us. And not having external people to go, you know, ask, yeah. you know, and get an approval before doing anything, right? You Those... don't have the bureaucracy that comes with a large company. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, a lot of people talk about entrepreneurs who start businesses with the end goal of selling right. out right. at some point and right. making that money and then having a good life, right. which is sad. Right. But uh, how is it that in a day and age, you know, both of you are young right. and if fat checks are being offered, it's right. a great way to, you know, yeah. Get out of it and, and you know maybe take a break, do something else, and follow a different passion. Right. Or what is stopping you uh, from doing that? Well, I mean, I, I keep questioning this myself, right? As in, like when I started, I had a, a rupee number in my mind saying, if I reach here, I'll, I'll retire. What was that? It was five crores actually. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, and uh, so, uh, but then yeah, you know, you could add many zeros next to it. But then I don't think. I think you know after a certain point you know that incrementally money is not going to make a difference. That's right? true. I mean, mm -hmm. you no. Know, I thought a big car, a big watch, I mean, good watch, etc., will make a difference. You know, but then you have it, and then there is more, right? As in, uh, so I think I think both me, Nikhil, Kalash. I mean, I think a bunch of core people on the team. I don't think money really drives us, you know, because if money drove us, uh, we would have raised money by now. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. like if someone's offering you. You know, valuing it a few billion dollars. You know, I mean, you yeah. take money off the table, right? Yeah, As in, yeah. you know, I mean, that's what smart people do. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, but I think, uh, yeah, I think we are doing this more out of you know just the joy of building this out, and there's no real end goal in mind as well. You know, so there isn't. I mean, it's a very non-entrepreneur-like thing to say that you know I have no end goal. I have, I'm not a single person in our office has a revenue t target. Really? Yeah. So there is uh, because you know. In a financial services firm, if you put revenue targets, potentially products can be missold. That's true. Right? So, uh, so we are like, you know, we don't want that to happen. Mm -hmm. So, how do you do it? So, it's a very chilled out kind of an atmosphere. The entire. So, we are like 1,100 member team today, and wow. uh, yeah, you know. So, uh, but yeah, but it's it's no pressure. You know, very easygoing kind of office, and so it's a very Bangalore like you know culture. You know, so. Sure. So. Uh, What's current, new, and happening, uh, you know, at the company right now? We we got our MBFC license. Uh, okay. So one of the things that we haven't done as a business is uh, is this whole lending against securities and margin funding. Uh, I mean, these are two important verticals of most brokerage firms. Uh, so so we we are starting that this year. Uh, uh, we are enabling Indians to be able to invest in U.S. equities as well. Oh really? Yeah, because. I think one of the issues in India for the low participation is because there aren't brands that millennials can you know kind of you know, relate, identi to. Yeah, yeah. relate yeah. to or identify yeah. right as in because like I, I keep thinking you know I, I'm not a millennial but you know but I, I don't think there's a single product that I consume that's listed on the Indian exchanges right and if you actually look at 
the last four or five years of the run in the US, the participation, the increase in participation, it's because of the fangs, you know, your yeah, the right, Facebooks and the Apple and, and the Amazon, Apple, yeah, yeah. Netflix and et cetera. Right? So people have kind of gone out there and invested into products that they consume, right? So so to get new people into the markets, we are saying can, you know, introducing such companies that people consume, uh, will it get them, you know, started? You know? So um, that's something that we are trying to do. And Nikhil, my younger brother, is, is probably the smartest trader that I know. He's been uh, prop trading like full time for, for a long time now. And, uh, and he's uh, he just floated a hedge fund, you know, we call it Rubicon. Uh, again, we are trying to disrupt there in the way, you know, hedge funds work. So we don't have any fixed fees as such, you know. So we are working on a 10% uh, of profit uh, share, you know, so we make money only if the people make money, and we are putting our own skin in the game. So we invest in the fund uh, as well. So, you know, so, uh, so yeah. So that's, uh, I mean, these are something new that's happening. You know, so. oh, very gutsy as, <laughs> as people. But tell me, how is it, you know, with two brothers working together? I mean, we've seen examples that have gone uh, very sour. Right. Uh, is that a is that something the family fears right. that you know? Uh, dealing with money and uh, and and businesses that there might be a rift in? Well, I mean, so the thing is, the right from day one, it, it was very clear, you know, when you started the business, you know, is that I build the broking business and and he's a really good trader, so he continues trading, you know, because, uh, and that's what he's done, right? And and now what he is trying to, you know, kind of do with the hedge fund is an extension of what he has been doing at Zerwada for all this while. Uh, so, and I've always focused, so we don't interfere, right? you know, if you were to ask me, like, Nathan, what's Nifty doing right now, I have no clue, right? I don't look at markets at all, I haven't taken a single trade from the time Zeroda started, because, you know, all trading is done by him, and similarly, he, I mean, of course, he gives inputs on our products and all of that, but he doesn't interfere in the business, so we have that very clear demarcation of, you know, what we both are trying to do. But for instance, let's say one brother gets more of the limelight than right. the other, all right. of that, right? I mean, psychologically, right. I mean, so, yeah, I mean, potentially could be an issue, but no, when you know your roles. How about managing success? Anybody who's, you know, achieved such meteoric success like you have, I mean, it kind of changes you as a person, you know, maybe you get a little bit more swag, mm. uh, you know, uh, and right. I really don't know how it would be because I don't have so much money, right. but I'm assuming people who have that kind of, uh, you know, success and money, sudden money, right. uh, kind of changes your entire personality and way of life. How have you dealt with that? No, I mean, I think, I think personally, I think that's the biggest challenge I have, right? As in like, you know, people associate money with certain smartness. Right? You know, it's like son, someone comes and says, Nathan, what should I get my son to do? You know, which college should he go? I'm like, dude, the hell, you know, like, why are you asking me? You know, like, you know, you know I mean, of course, you come to me, ask about broking, stock markets, capital markets, I can give you some advice. I, I have learned no shit about life just because I made some money, right? You know, so it's, uh, so I think, I think that's, that's tough, you know, it's just to remain sane when people around you are just, you know, kind of, you know, boosting your ego all the time saying, dude, you made money, or you know, you must be super smart. You know, you know, you, you're like this guruji. But you know, how you, come you don't believe it? I mean, I know so many people right. who are arrogant and don't deserve to be arrogant. <laughs> right. No, I mean, I think, uh, like, no, I, as I said, I think that's probably part of the maturity that you know trading has taught. You know, is that uh, the thing about trading? I've I, I've blown out um, when I've got an arrogant. You know, so and <laughs> okay. I, I've done three years of my call center life you know, working almost 18, 20 hours a day, you know, uh, by being arrogant. So I, I've learned it really hard way that, uh, you know, you can't, you can't get arrogant in life. And, and maybe it's also got to do a little bit genes as well. So, you know, mm, yeah, uh, sure. right? because I don't think, you know, you have to be born a certain way, right? You can't really learn any of this, you know. Uh, so I think, I think, yeah, I, I probably, uh, you know, my father is kind of like this, you know, very peaceful, very, you know, uh, doesn't react and all of that. So. So yeah, so I think uh, genes help as well. <laughs> well, it was just lovely chatting with you. Uh, so nice to meet uh, a unicorn who is so uh, rooted. Right. And uh, what a great success story, uh, you know, a 10-year story. And uh, here's wishing you, uh, you know, uh, another <laughs> decade of extreme success and a great innings. And hopefully you'll be asked, as transparent and as credible <laughs> as you've been in the past. Cheers. Thanks a lot for having me here.